So, welcome everyone to this second episode of my of our in-depth exploration of Web3 and crypto with myself and Stephen Deal. If you want to find out more about these series or catch up on other episodes, please visit lifeitself.us slash web3. I want to start by giving a little bit of context for this series for people who are new or who are, you know, or who didn't get it last time. Web3 has become a massive phenomenon with very bold claims made about its potential impact, claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism, better and faster, et cetera, to claims for radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. At the same time, there is an exceptional lack of agreement about these claims, or you could put it the other way around, an exceptional level of disagreement of, about these claims even on basic points and definitions. And overall, this is an exceptionally controversial and polarizing topic with strong pro and anti camps. And for example, within tech, it is one of the most controversial topics we have ever seen. And significantly disagreement cuts across classic ideological lines. For example, there are pro and anti libertarians as well as pro and anti Marxists. This series is about helping ourselves and others make sense of what is going on and to try and reach some kind of consensus on the key questions and claims, as well as on answers. You know, are those claims, you know, mostly true or mostly not true? We are starting by exploring the, some of the specific hopes, aspirations, and associate ideologies that are driving this area and that are driving the claims underlying this area. And our approach is to try and steal man the various positions and evaluate them. So what you'll hear on this series, and you really want to bear this in mind, is we're going to try and take the different positions, whether we agree or don't agree with them personally or not, and try and make the, mo the best version of those positions, and then critically evaluate that position. And today, we're going to start, today, the position we're going to look at is a position that we could term the trader or market fundamentalist position. Is that right, Stephen? Do you want to say a little bit about what we're going to look at today? Sure. So unlike in the last series where we talked about uh, the digital gold narrative around crypto assets uh, and the gold standard um, that are held by some of the neo-metalists in the crypto space, today we're going to be talking about a, a position that is a lot less um, political in nature. Um, it's not about making the world a better place. It's just about making money. Um, and this is a position that we think is a very widely held one. And it's one that's held by a kind of broad spectrum of individuals. Uh, everybody from like the person kind of trading crypto on an app in a pub as a kind of day trader, uh, all the way up to the most sophisticated quant funds and uh, family offices and hedge funds in the world um, that are trading these things as if they were just any other asset class. Uh, and this probably represents a kind of a large majority of people of varying levels of sophistication and it's a very kind of rich area to talk about because it just describes and encompasses so many people. Yeah, so in essence, we could call this the trader position or even the market fundamentalist position when we come to talk about ideology. And as you emphasize, and I just want to build on that, while it isn't, this isn't a position that's actually widely kind of talked about so much in the space in a way, because it often doesn't even seem like an ideology or a, a viewpoint. And but you, nevertheless, I think that's something we really want to emphasize. This position is really worth looking at because, in fact, it may represent the majority of the people active in this kind of space, even in the Web3 space around token issuance and so on. And in even more importantly, this group of people, especially more at the kind of sophisticated trader at the end of the spectrum, potentially lend significant political, social and social kind of clout and legitimation to this space. Those people's involvement, you know, that Goldman Sachs are involved, maybe, or JP Morgan are involved in, in crypto or so on, provides this significant legitimation for, the, for, what's, for what's happening generally, even if those people are coming from an art industry associated with many other of the viewpoints in, in the space. So we think it's a really valuable one to explore. Now, to start with, why do we think it's important? Uh, you know, what, sorry, what... What's, we want to start by looking at the steel man version of this position. What's the, uh, 
you know, best version of this we could put forward. And I want to, in a moment, Stephen, you know, maybe you could say something a little bit about this. Like, what do we think is like the, the if we could, we were setting out the best way, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, it's the notion that, you know, we can trade crypto assets um, on markets um, and that we can treat them as if they're just any other kind of asset class to kind of detach from the kind of political imaginaries of like either the libertarians or the utopians, right? It's just another asset class. It's just like buying Apple stock or trading derivatives. Um, and it's generally a kind of overarching umbrella philosophy that markets are good um, and that very, very... Um, laissez-faire markets are even better um, and it even takes that to an extension um, of the fact that maybe there's some um, sort of regulations around markets that are actually prohibitive and that uh, maybe we could go into a more you know even extreme form of capitalism and that would be a good thing uh, because markets are generally good they're a way of taking information uh, and producing products that people want to buy and that you can make money off of uh, price discovery on those assets uh, and this is all natural it's all good um, and this is just part of capitalism doing its thing yeah and, and i think you even want to just uh, to put it in the best version of it um, i mean obviously there's also an aspect that people are going to make money like greed is good markets and, and often like that phrase not only is the kind of greed is good the markets work but it's also associated with boom times generally and it has been a boom time in that you know people have made sort of magical amounts of money including some re retail investors as well as the the sophisticated ones um and we want to i think just to kind of build on what you're saying there's a there's a kind of version of markets i think that we could think of as that of that version which is like evolution you know, you might not like evolution sometimes, but it works in the long run. You know, evolution may mean that like the lion eats the, the gazelle and that doesn't seem very nice. But in the long run, that produces a kind of more fit, fitter um, set of species who are more efficient, more complex or whatever. And similarly, there's a sense that with markets, you know, very, you know, it might be ruthless. It might mean that the, the kind of Wall Street traders kind of... Uh, you know, eating eating the lunch of the retail traders or whatever, or is able to engage in using particular information in certain ways. But that's, it, you know, if they if they take all the money from the little guy or whatever, then that's not a problem because that's market efficiency in a way. If you're if you're dumb or you allow yourself to get front run or you believe in some pump and dump scam around a token, well, okay, you, you know, it's just like kind of Darwinian. You'll get eliminated from the system, and. I think it would just be generous this, while this may not seem, you know, in some sense very nice, there is something to be said for evolution and there is something to be said for the efficiency of markets uh, in that regard. And that's where maybe in its, its kind of strongest version it is kind of coming from. Yeah, I'll follow up and say that this is a very popular view in the United States that uh, markets, you know, while they may be brutal, while they may be, you know, uh, very the induced competition, maybe extreme forms of it, that ultimately on long timescales, they produce prosperity. And that's not without some historical precedent. You know, the system that we live under is a capitalist one. And obviously, you know, if you look over the, the arc of human history, um, you know, our quality of life has gotten better under market capitalism. Uh, and, you know, experiments to the contrary have proven sort of either mixed or, um, you know, unsuccessful in the past. And so like, there's a kind of the capitalist realism position is that like, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And so this is just the, the natural environment that we as humans find ourselves in. And we should just uh, try to make the best of it for both ourselves and for, you know, the broader economy. And that's just the way the world works. Yeah, and to kind of give some evidence for this, I mean, here's just a quote I get from an FT article talking to, I think it's the CEO or certainly a senior person at the Man Investment Group, which is a major uh, kind of algorithmic trading hedge fund. He's like, if you look at cryptocurrencies as a whole, it's a pure trading instrument. There's no inherent worth in it whatsoever. It's a tulip bulb, Ellis said, referring to the flower that became the focus of the 17th century Dutch tulip financial mania. And to kind of take the essence of that position, it's like, well, you know, even if I know, even if I think this is a bubble, if I make, if we, you know, in some ways, even if I'm trading really efficiently, that might bring the bubble to an end quicker. Uh, if, even if that wipes out a bunch of people, that's 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 kind of capitalism, red in tooth and claw, as you said, working. And 
in addition, these booms and busts are maybe a natural part of micro market cycles. Um, and I think it also sort of this question, even if there's sort of no, some of those discussion, there's no fundamentals that, that kind of crypto products are like the ultimate. It's not like when I trade Apple stock, Apple actually do make phones. They sell them to people. Um, there's some kind of productive enterprise that in a way maybe doesn't really matter because this is just, it's another form of market and markets are, are useful. They information discovery mechanisms, et cetera. Yeah, just, I mean, just to expand on the notion, because I think that FT article is actually quite insightful. Like the, there's the CIO of the main group, which is a, a very large uh, quant fund. Um, and, you know, they describe uh, trading crypto tokens as being like trading tulips mm -hmm. during the, the tulip mania in the Netherlands. And the thing about tulips is that they have no, you know, fundamental value. They have a small bit of use value for like aesthetic reasons, but uh, nothing to kind of justify the kind of meaning that we saw at the time. And so people started trading tulip bulbs, you know, for, you know, hundreds of thousands of multiples on their, you know, use value, right? And uh, super tokens may have the same kind of thing. Like there's no, they're a very pathological financial product if we want to treat them as that, um, because they don't have underlying like cash flows. Uh, there's no fundamentals on these things. Uh, there's no revenue, there's no product that they sell, there's no coupon as if it's like a bond, there's no underlying if it's like a derivative, but that doesn't really matter uh, because you know ultimately it's a greater full asset. You can trade it, you can create a market for these things. It can actually be a quite liquid market. Uh, and if people want to trade sort of fundamentalist positions, then that should be their right to do because uh, markets are good. And this is something that we can offer and that we should offer. I, I and that even is like, you know, even if, for example, many of the things in this area, the many of the protections that normally are around traditional securities aren't there. Well, people are going, people know that they are going in with their eyes open. This is the Wild West. And we get a chance, you know, as, as we say, you know, it's you, you kind of caveat emptor or kind of caveat participator. And I think that we can go a little bit even better in the steel manning of the thesis, if I understand it. We could say another level of that, which boom, this is like, even if you use a tulip bulbs, kind of it's markets and they ultimately lead to kind of elimination of the weak, success of the strong and a more fitter economy and system. There's, an, there's a kind of a second thesis, which is slightly stronger maybe, which are tokens are an investment product um, that secure kind of compute cycles for people to run computation on a globally distributed state machine, using the market to create game theoretic incentives to run one another's computations of public good. And that, that state machine has an operating cost. And that in a, this we're here, we're talking about the, the potential ideology of the kind of almost speculator trader type who don't necessarily care about the state machine and the public goods. But basically what we could say is, well, my, my, um, my trading and everything else is providing kind of providing liquidity, providing demand to finance the operation of that, that other good. That's a kind of, almost like slightly better version of the initial kind of hypothesis, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, this kind of feeds on the kind of Silicon Valley kind of utopian vision, which we'll kind of get into probably in a later one. But like the fundamental part of this is that uh, people that are trading things like the Ethereum token, you know, the speculation on the token itself creates liquidity, uh, which creates a marketplace, which creates um, a set of incentives to basically secure this network and that gives rise to this distributed state machine that we can use to run you know blockchain programs right um and so that basically you know the greed is good thesis is actually greed is good and it gives us a world computer right that's the essence of, of the hypothesis um and that's you know if a bunch of wall street funds want to basically you know trade these tokens well that's actually a good thing because it just you know increases the the stakeholders in the network and more stakeholders are good because there's more participants involved and that creates a richer and more dynamic ecosystem and ultimately um you know gives rise to all of this uh this value that people perceive on on the asset class i think this is similar just to make an aside to if you talk to sometimes often quant funds um who you know in a classic world it's you know purely or high frequency trading it's kind of zero sum you know it's it's not 
it's not obvious that it's productive, quote unquote, but their argument was like, this provides liquidity, this provides things in the financial system that are useful or price discovery or things like that. So that's like a second hypothesis. And then there's an, another one, which is we can treat crypto tokens as this kind of synthetic hedge against the entire class of assets with fundamentals. Um, or, you know, it's like a bit like another goal. This is a place to park money in times of loose monetary policy like now to chase yield when there's nothing else left to buy and because other funds certainly are going to trade the thesis. So do you want to say that's like the second, that's almost like the, the meta version of this. Do you want to say a bit about that hypothesis? Yeah, so this is a particularly sort of nuanced position that it's a little different than the first hypothesis that we talked about, but there are definitely some funds that actually trade this position. Um, that basically um, when there's a glut of money floating around because of um, you know, just overpriced over uh, valuations in the public markets uh, or because of um, you know, an excess of inflow of money from the central banks, um, there's just a lot of money chasing yield and not a lot of places for it to go. And so the kind of crypto asset class kind of provides a buffer for that money to go until market dynamics will kind of um, decrease the money supply or kind of redistribute it. And so basically it's a way to kind of park, it's an asset class of last resort. Um, and it may be actually be that this is kind of either a positive or a zero sum or negative sum asset class, but given the choice between chasing yield uh, on a negative sum asset class or parking it in um, cash, um, some funds might prefer simply just to put it in these kind of assets because uh, at least there's a potential for a return versus on cash there obviously isn't. Um, and you can think of, this is a very subtle like quant argument that like you can create this completely synthetic hedge against the entire class of all asset classes that have fundamentals. So crypto is a hedge against literally conceptually all asset classes that have fundamentals. And this is a, it's a strange thesis because it's kind of like a short position on like all of human productivity. Uh, but this might kind of be true or the market may affirm it simply by on the back of a lot of funds simply trade it this way. And so it becomes Some true by virtue of the fact that large, you know, funds put lots of money toward this thesis and that becomes the true. I think there are a couple of things in here that we do want to pull apart, which is that a lot of the uh, the day trader mentality, like the ideology is just like, hey, my friend made a load of money. You know, like there's a kind of just an aspect of that, which I think most of the time we can see probably in the long run won't work out. You know, we can't uh, even just saying like Bitcoin right now, it, it can't go up another probably thousand times very easily or a hundred times again. Um, you know, there's a kind of limit to that, com that, that bit behavior. The, the, I think the thing that we're getting at though here is that a lot of the justification or the ideological stuff particularly comes from the more high-end traders and, and, and especially relate to the fact that this is an area we want to emphasize with extraordinary little regulation. Like it, it, it has been an area with things that seem like securities or maybe commodities or maybe money, but have very few of the regulations about that, particularly about what you can do in these spaces. And we're going to come to that a little bit in the critique, but I want to emphasize now a lot of things that are almost actually straight out illegal in terms of trading particularly for sophisticated investors to do to kind of retail investors um front running being the most one very classic one you know i know what you're going to buy because you come and trade with me uh, and lots of other people and i'm going to simply put orders in in front of what you're going to do which will move the price and take advantage of, of you it's basically not illegal at, at all in most of these markets and so it is something where this kind of justification of really just raw market trading is kind of especially important um, because otherwise there'd be a question of like, hey, aren't, aren't, isn't the game rigged or aren't the, the big guys kind of the sharks eating the minnows? Um, and I think we'll come to that in a moment. I want to emphasize that why this position is so kind of raw or this market fundamentalist position comes out so strongly in this area is because it is a sort of wild west at the present. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Um, this is like market since we haven't seen since like the 1920s. Um, and basically, you know, it's this kind of raw kind of Dostoevsky and worldview and like, you know, where there's no SEC, all is permitted. Um, and, you know, like the Wild West metaphor is exactly right. Um, 
And, you know, for some of these sophisticated funds, you know, that seems very appealing to them um, because, you know, markets haven't been this inefficient and sort of this loose and unregulated since, you know, the last 80 years. Um, and, you know, if you're a large fund and you have a couple billion assets under management, um, you know, this is, this is actually very exciting because, you know, in equities markets, you can't front run, you can't do all these tricks that have been banned for 40, 50 years because the SEC will come in and arrest you. I mean, we threw Martha Stewart in jail for like insider trading on like $30,000, right? And, uh, you know, you just can't get away with a lot of these market crimes in, in the US stock market anymore. Um, but, you know, the it's important to note that the, the mandate of these kind of funds um, is they take investment from very sophisticated people, high net worth individuals, they pull it to an investment vehicle. Uh, and their job is to basically take positions that are uncorrelated with the market. Because when you have high net worth individuals, typically their exposure is to the public equities markets. And so if they're looking for diversification, they go to hedge funds to find you know, income streams that are uncorrelated with the broader market. Uh, and that's just their fiduciary mandate. That's just hedge funds being hedge funds. Um, and they you know, the argument is that they perform a vital role in our markets, that they perform price discovery on asset classes that otherwise people wouldn't be able to, to price. They buy things like, um, you know, non-public equity. Uh, they buy things like, you know, everything from you know, art to, to sneakers and trainers. And like, that's actually good because it increases liquidity for these assets and it allows price discovery. And if hedge funds don't do those things, then nobody else will. Uh, and so actually, you should let them trade the crypto markets because, you know, these are the sharks, they're sophisticated, they have the expertise, and they're doing it on behalf of full knowledge of their clients. Um, and if retail investors want to jump in with the sharks, you know, that's on them. Uh, because ultimately, uh, it's a choice to participate in these markets. And um, that's just, uh, just the nature of, you know, capitalism. And uh, it's an extreme form of capitalism but it is an extension of the things that we do today already. And legitimately, you know, in markets today, there are some very strange, like derivatives products that, you know, funds are allowed to trade because they are sophisticated and they know how to, you know, trade these things at a very high level. Um, and it's, you know, hedge funds fighting other hedge funds. And so there's not a whole lot of uh, tears being shed when, you know, one of these places go out of business because that's part of the business. So I want to kind of, I think we've done, you know, to sum up here, the steel man version of the trader view, I think obviously the, there's one we haven't even mentioned. We mentioned the verse version where most line goes up. This is just an area where everyone seems to make money and isn't that wonderful. It's a magic money machine. I think I, 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 we don't give a lot to that because I think much examination that just do, doesn't hold water. The, the perpetual money machine doesn't work. But that might be some of the day trader ideology. Like, you know, one, this is like no one's getting hurt and people are making amazing amounts of money. The second one, which I think we focus on here, is sort of markets as, you know, markets like evolution. Evolution might not always be attractive when we watch the nature program and see the gazelle get taken down by the line. But that's, that's uh, natural selection. That's evolution working. This is market evolution. This is market natural selection you you know it, there, there are no rules you're allowed to do anything it's it and ultimately it provides whether it's liquidity it might support ethereum or something working it allows some people to make money and from other people and like this kind of natural selection of the system but basically overall markets are work they yeah. they, they might not be attractive sometimes but in the long run they produce fitness they produce uh, better results and financial markets in particular here we're talking about so i think we want to now come to the critique of that and um i think the, the the kind of question obviously here i don't know we could start with i think is why you know it is a kind of fundamental piece of economics and i'm, I'm a background as an economist which is asymmetric information and the market for lemons thesis which obviously the Nobel prize went to akalov for and which is a simple point which is markets are good and Akalov's famous paper which was about the, the kind of market for lemons for used cars and it was a point what happens when two people don't know the same thing and what happens in marketplaces where there's systematic asymmetry of information between two parties whether it's health insurers who don't know about the health condition of their partners or I'm buying a car from you Stephen and you know how good your car is but I don't and it actually is, funnily, is almost like markets are good position, but points out for markets to work, we need some degree of often symmetry of information. 
if I don't, if I don't know what your car is like and you do, I might just have be, I might be like, if Stephen's offering me that car for five thousand dollars, it's probably not maybe maybe it's he knows more than I do. So probably it's not worth five thousand dollars, it's worth less or something. And we can end up in a situation where we spiral downwards. Well then you offer less, but I'm like it's worth even less. And there's no trade. Akalov's famous papers argument was you could end up with a used car market where people don't do trades if there's insufficient trust uh, in the kind of or insufficient symmetry of information. And stock markets are very like that. We actually have stock markets and or other kinds of markets for good reason to raise capital for enterprises, to allocate capital from different people to other people. And like the market for used cars, if there's too much um, asymmetry of information, therefore too much ability for uh, the person I'm trading with to take advantage of my lack of knowledge, I might be unwilling to participate. And at that point, these capital markets wouldn't function so well. So, you know, just, just to put it in a nutshell, the, one of the great reasons why the SEC exists, why these, the reforms of the 1930s of the stock market of the, what happened in the 1920s, why we don't allow front running, wash trading and all of these other aspects is because we actually do care about markets but we have asymmetric information. I don't really want to build on that and get into maybe the specifics of what goes on at the moment and which is in the long run maybe problematic for these markets. Even if, we, even if you really wanted crypto to succeed, you really want Web3 to succeed, in the long run, what's the problem of this kind of Wild West setup? Yeah, so you're right. Like if we want to accept the kind of capitalist thesis and we really like markets, well, we want, should want markets to work in the best form possible. And you're exactly right. Like the normal price um, winner said, you know, markets work best when there's not like large pools of people with non-public information that they can use uh, to advantage themselves. And uh, there's a lot of kind of, and this is a really complicated concept. It's like market crimes are a thing, but they're often kind of very victimless crimes because they're, crimes against like price discovery or like the efficiency of the market or against trust in the market. So it's a really abstract thing. Um, like you can be completely removed from the victims of the crime, but the crime is in sense against the market itself. And this takes a while to wrap your head around kind of from an ethical standpoint. Um, but like there's a collection of behaviors that largely we found um, largely through trial and error and a lot of accidents and mishaps um, that aren't necessarily the best things for markets. Um, because they allow certain individuals privileged access to information or privileged access to trade with a disadvantage or a superior advantage um, over other participants. And these are things like um, front running, which we already talked about, which is basically having you know, non-public information about order execution of other market participants before they do. Um, so can things that, like Mark- Can you make that concrete? So, you know, I let's say I'm, I'm a normal, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm Rufus, I'm the retail, you know, I'm, I'm the retail investor, but you're the person running like the exchange or whatever. And I come to you and I say, I want to buy, I don't know, uh, you know, Dogecoin. And you know now that I want to buy Dogecoin so you can go and buy Dogecoin before me, which moves the price up a little bit and then sell that Dogecoin as it were to me. And that small difference though, constantly is like some set of percent that you're kind of just taking from my pocket over time. Yeah, you're literally just draining money from the market by using your information asymmetry to anticipate other market participants' behavior. Um, and that means the, the price is, you know, synthetically inflated because of your, you know, information asymmetry. And so that's certainly why market makers and people that are privileged in our society, um, they're not allowed to prioritize their own buying and selling behavior over that of their clients. Uh, and they have to have follow this thing called the national bid best offer list on equity markets um, in which they can't prioritize their specific trades and they can't act on non-public order flow information. Um, and that's front running. Uh, that's a particularly pernicious crime that it's a market maker crime, generally speaking. Um, and then we have things like wash trading as well, where wash trading is where you basically buy and sell a product from yourself. So you're basically both sides of a trade. Um, and so that allows you to kind of artificially increase the, the volume of trades or to synthetically pump the price of an asset uh, by creating, you know, basically trades that wash back and forth between yourself. Um, so this is a sort of non-economic activity because ultimately you're the counterparty of both of these trades. And so it creates sort of a false information in the market, which kind of can confuse price formation. 
uh, and that's generally considered a malign behavior. And doing this in you know public markets is, is illegal since the 1930s. Um, and then we have things like insider trading as well, which basically means it's a broad category that we already covered a little bit of, but like it's a broad category of trading on information that's currently not reflected in the market. So say you work at a company, uh, you're going to go launch a new product next year and you're working on that product and you go out to public markets and say you're going to buy up all the stock because you know that the product's going to be a winner, right? Um, now, you have non-public information that the rest of the public doesn't have and so you can anticipate uh, to some degree, what will actually happen with the price. Um, and that ultimately comes from the pockets of people who get in later when they figure out that information. So it's a crime against market efficiency. Um, and that's banned. We, we sent Martha Stewart to jail for that. We sent you know, dozens of people or hundreds of people for that because it's just generally, it's not a good thing. It's hard to catch, but you know, it's, it's also a market crime. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and to emphasize here, these things seem kind of pernicious, but as they as they kind of corrode the trust and faith in the market, they ultimately, they, they actually kill, I mean, the irony would be done enough, they actually even kill, they, they kind of, they kill the thing they were based on. It's like very parasitic. If you do this enough, obviously, retail investors or others just leave the market um, or something. So it's kind of one of those things where even in, in the long run, you wouldn't want it if you were a brokerage or others, but in the short run, you would do it. Um, but let's keep going. So just like this, I mean, I want to limit our time on this one, but it's just like, you know, you could go read a textbook. We could just add arbitrarily halting trading. Um, this is particularly for exchanges and others who just simply stop trading at inconvenient moments. Is that right? You know, that, um, there's price manipulation, order book tampering. There's clear pump and dumps. There's canceling orders arbitrarily, refusing cash withdrawal to customers, offering 125 times leverage on positions, uh, on options. And you know, one of the things, clearing house and in-house prop trading are in the same room. Again, you'd need to know a little bit, and we'll come to that in a moment, what that means. Uh, exchanges have their own proprietary trading arms. They trade against their own clients, uh, it seems, on, on occasion. So there's just kind of like, just like the whole list of stuff that has been generally regulated. And regulated, might, you might say, in the interest of the market, for often going on 80 years 100 years is kind of just back um and 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 in the long run is kind of clearly would actually would it would kind of kill it would kind of kill the animal they're they're living on if it were went to an extreme uh, but at the very least is is kind of tends to transfer money from the ordinary retail investor to the, the to the kind of the pockets of either the sophisticated kind of uh, traders or the exchanges themselves. Yeah, and just to speak to that, like there's a very good reason back in like um, the 1930s that we started decided to like split up the like conflicts of interest that can possibly exist on people who maintain financial infrastructure. So like in our system currently, like in the United States, there's a clear separation between like clearing houses brokers that actually sell directly to customers and the market maker themselves, right? So all of these parties have a, you know, non-public set of information and they're forced to become, you know, three different entities in our system to minimize conflicts of interest. So they're not sitting there in the room, like with the traders going over there and saying like, oh, what's happening with all of our clients? Like, you know, um, we've separated up these entities for a very good reason. And at least on the market makers, these are extremely regulated entities where like, you know, order book formation is one of the most regulated activities in market making, because that's actually where price formation happens on the assets. And if you have access to that, you have a great deal of information. Um, and the fact that, you know, if you had like a prop trading, which is like an in-house hedge fund uh, with access to the, the direct market data, you could do some really, really amazing things uh, because you have probably the most privileged information to basically set and make the market however you want it to make. And that's very different than a market where, you know, we participate, that's a market that's being made by somebody who is also in the market, right? And so this lends itself to basically like recreating what we used to call bucket shops from like the 1920s, where these were kind of uh, really, really fraudulent enterprises that used to sell, you know, all of these kind of synthetic positions to people um, with non-public information. And the crypto ecosystem happens to have, you know, the clearing houses, the brokers, and the market makers. Guess what? That's one vertically integrated entity with no regulation that could have its own prop trading division and trade against its own clients and use all of the dirty tricks that have been illegal for 80 years. 
And you can sure as hell bet a lot of people are making a lot of money on that kind of very pathological form of markets. And that's not really capitalism anymore. This is a very, it's like a casino bucket shop kind of world now. And that's... It's a casino. It's a casino where, you know, uh, like, let's just put, like, put it metaphorically. You went a casino and when you ran, when you won a lot, selling the casino shut and said, hey, you know, we're not giving you the tokens or, uh, you know, until we trade again, you know, we're going to force you to keep playing until we're back in business or where they, they, they're playing other hands, but they get to look at the hand. You know, you're playing, you're playing like poker against them, but the house gets to look at everyone's cards. Um, you know, let's just understand. And we're not going to name names here, but just to be kind of clear, basically we, what we're also saying is this is happening, that you are seeing this lack of separation of market maker, clearing house and broker plus prop plus prop trading desk going on kind of ubiquitously across this ecosystem um you know and that's that's you know that in the long run if you even really care about crypto and web3 either way if you really care about crypto and web3 that's going to have to be a disaster because in the long run that's just a guarantee for siphoning money from the general participants in the system into the hands of those stakeholders and if you're a critic of crypto or web3 that's like outrageous in the sense you're just allowing people to run the kind of games that were like the kind of like kind of rip-off games uh, that were, that were banned for really good reasons and which not only take money right now but undermine the faith in key systems of our society because that's the thing when this goes wrong there's going to be a lot of blaming of the sec if it did go wrong being like oh you should have done something and it's going to undermine our faith again in institutions and trust in our society so i want to move a little bit from that point there to kind of come to to, to say we we've talked on that point but what does this what is this actually oh sorry one other thing that we wanted to cover was we don't know about systemic risk so another thing that obviously can happen in financial markets um, that flow over into the real economy are when kind of speculative excesses go wrong or when there's people get over leveraged, um, we have systemic risk. We have a kind of risk of a market sort of kind of regressing the other direction from a bubble and then that affecting the wider economy. And one point we have at the moment is this because of the, the market so often opaque and unregulated, we don't really know what kind of leverage is baked into this market. Is that right, Stephen? Yeah, um, just the entire, we have millions of retail traders um, that have, you know, on paper, paper values uh, are notional values, like they're gains that are not realized. You know, you're holding a position with a counterparty that you could theoretically, you know, turn into cash, but you haven't yet. Um, a notional value comes with, you know, counterparty risk associated with it. And that counterparty risk is that, like, when you go to one of these places, the funds may not be there, right? So just when you uh, say these, pla these places, just to clarify, you go to your exchange, you go to, to yeah, sorry, go ahead, yeah. You go to a crypto exchange, and they're not holding all of the money, the dollars and the euros that you would possibly need to unwind all of the notional value of the entire market, obviously. So it's unclear uh, how much, like, leverage, how much of a sort of debt there is between, you um, the notional value and the actual realizable value that these people or that the traders could actually realize. And that could be very low, that maybe if even like 0.5% of the market decided to withdraw, the entire thing could come crashing down because there's so much sort of debt instruments issued in these things. And that basically informs all the price formation on these assets. And particularly these stable coins uh, are basically a form of unsecured debt that we have no idea. They're opaque black boxes that we know are large amounts of unsecured debt that are used to buy uh, large amounts of assets in the market. So if we don't know what the leverage ratio on these things is, they could be a hundred thousand times X leverage. They could be backed by nothing because they're complete black boxes. And from a systemic risk perspective, that should scare you a lot because um, when markets unwind like this, they unwind fast and they unwind hard when there's it becomes clear there's not enough money to cash out. Um, and this is something that doesn't happen in traditional equities markets. Let's just emphasize this in terms, again, people understand, like, uh, I mean, we all understand maybe listeners, but this like a bank run in a bank takes your money when you deposit money, but in a way they leverage it. They've got the actual money in deposit, but then they can issue loans and they can issue in a way more loans than they actually have money necessarily in the bank. And that's allowed. 
There are reasons for that, but they're regulated. And obviously the risk is they, they in theory, people pay back their loans. They have, a, they have enough money to pay everyone out. And we've now put, because of the issue of bank runs and then the loss of faith in the banking system, we have a lot of regulations. We also have deposit insurance. We guarantee generally that you will get your money back if you put it in a bank. But as a result, we also don't allow banks to take on too much leverage. And in fact, again, that was one of the things that happened in the last financial crisis. And what we're saying right now is essentially the exchange and certainly some of the stable coins are allowing, I'm not saying they're banks, but they act in this way of being able to take in kind of money and then leverage it up. At levels we have no transparency on, um, there's certainly some evidence that that is happening, that leverage is significantly happening. And that, as you said, this creates significant systemic risk. Um, that, and that's an unknown unknown. And when it does go wrong, it's not like it goes wrong gently. It goes wrong fast and in, 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 in problematic ways. So let's just kind of lead, like those are the things, what does it actually lead to in society? So I want to spell out in this sense in the critique of why, uh, what the, problem, the problems are. So one is just inequality. When we have this kind of like asymmetric information markets, uh, when we have... Uh, uh, things like that. When we have clearing house, market brokers, prop trading all in the same room, it basically transfers money from the from the, the majority generally to the minority, whether those are sophisticated, whether those are exchanges, whether those are sophisticated traders or whatever. Now, that might, you might just say that again, coming back to the, the steel man, you might just say that's evolution. That's just, uh, that's just how it is. But in general, when you allow that inequality, particularly in that kind of exploitative way to happen, it leads to a backlash, it leads to uh, unhappiness in society, it leads to breakdowns of various kinds. So one deeper point is that then this leads to inequality. And then I think the second point that we wanna make in the critique here, when you look at it, is at a more fundamental level, it undermines key institutions, including, as we've mentioned, markets themselves. If you actually believe in capital markets, and I can say here for myself, I certainly do think capital markets are generally beneficial uh, in some, in many, in many areas. When you undermine faith in them, when if I'm going to invest in the stock market and I actually think a good portion of my, of, is kind of getting creamed off by the middle person, um, that's a problem. Uh, and it's kind of an irony here, by the way, because often many people in crypto feel that the kind of existing system's kind of rigged or unfair, but they're, what's odd is this is a system that's even like sort of more rigged or unfair um and so one is that there's this kind of it the really i think pernicious consequence at the moment of a wild west type setup that one could argue is that it leads this distrust and cynicism it actually and it, it's sort of self-fulfilling um in that regard it's like okay i'm out for myself other people are just out for themselves dishonesty and exploitation are a normal part of capitalist society. It sort of normalizes that, which isn't, shouldn't, isn't, and shouldn't be the case. Um, it's, it's kind of subversive opportunism. Just because you can trade something doesn't mean it's good for the world. You know, we can trade slaves, we can trade opium, we can trade asbestos, but does that mean that we should? Um, and then I don't know what other, like, I think you've also mentioned like there's moral hazard um there's a moral hazard issue here do you want to say a little bit about that Stephen in the kind of distrust and cynicism part yeah I mean when you have markets that have this level of manipulation it's really hard to even call them markets anymore uh because like fundamentally these are just kind of you know asymmetric wealth transfers from people who are like inside of our cartel of people that can manipulate the markets and move them uh from unsophisticated people that don't understand the market dynamics of these things or just choose to avoid it or ignore it entirely and the moral hazard part is that like if we allow the public to basically take you know their their savings their their hard-earned money that they were from their wages and like dump it into these markets you know it's disproportionately just you know increasing public risk that this is all going to go very badly and the people who are going to get hurt are the people who probably can't afford to lose um the uh you know the money that they're going to put in because they're not in the cartel uh and so that basically transfers like risk from the public um you know <laughs> and then basically you know gives the returns to like private individuals that are basically incentivized to create even more manipulated markets uh and that to me seems like a very kind of pernicious and 
almost pathological form of, of market making capitalism. Uh, because you know there's so much information asymmetry at that point that it's really hard to even call these things markets and that, that's a point also just to emphasize even about the dow setup which is essentially you have something which look like well not even initial initial public offerings or kind of equity offerings in something but without most disclosures that have become required for good reasons in the world that if you're going to do an inter initial public offering where, where retail investors can participate there are a whole bunch of rules to make sure you adequately disclose risk you adequately disclose the state of your of your enterprise just to take another example where again it reduces faith in a key area if you're a capitalist of our capitalist system which is faith in investing in new enterprises and so on and so forth um, i think it wants to this this deeper point which is the irony also here is if, if it were to go wrong, who will get blamed? Will be the state and its institution, the traditional state. People will then be turning around saying, well, where was the SEC? Where were uh, regulators? Where were, uh, you know, and of course, there's a dilemma today because I think many people who are in those positions feel, oh, but this might be innovative and so on. But we do, there is this risk, which is the trust and it has fallen in our state and our institutions to record lows in many countries and is yet one of the most essential things to having a, a working society is trust in each other, trust in our in the institutions that we have set up, certainly in democratic states. And I think that's one of the critical points here to say that this, when we talk about victimless crimes, that maybe is one of the greatest kind of victims that we can't see which is our trust in each other and in the institutions that we have created in society and finally as we said in markets they're assuming that markets especially financial markets have some value then undermining faith in them is problematic now the funny thing here is you could have a pretty nihilist position well i don't want to call it a nihilist position you could have a view that capitalism is, and you could be coming you may be somewhat places out there maybe hidden within andreessen horowitz are some like secret hardcore socialist communist types who are like we actually really want to destroy capitalism and our method to that is like have this kind of like unbridled dysfunctional wild west capitalism and that will undermine faith in it once and for all you know it's kind of like um it would be this kind of incredible like double agent or you know like kind of undercover agent approach i don't think that is the case and so if you do do have faith in uh, it, it, at least people who do have faith in financial markets, it, to some extent, you'd be like, underfaining faith in them is problematic. And look at the 1920s and 30s, that didn't end well. Um, and we want to look at that. And I finally want to add one, I think, for myself, and I don't have the clip here, unfortunately, to show today, but I might paste it up with the video. But there's an incredible uh, section from Sebastian Sargaldo, who is a, a magnum photographer, who covered a gold rush in 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 brazil in the 1980s and he talked about the kind of he was like the the greatest thing he said the greatest impact you know these were people he said who go into this kind of pit in the middle of you know nowhere in brazil and like descending into this pit to kind of dig gold and he's like these were university graduates these were people with jobs these were sometimes highly intelligent people caught by the dream of making it rich in a moment and he was like, the greatest thing was that kind of corruption of character. When we living in a, when he says like, when you've been touched by gold, you can never let it go. It's kind of, it's, it's sort of this, it's this, and it's, we kind of, it's, it's, that's the greatest, that makes us a slave. And I think that's another point here, which is this error in general has, brings this kind of incredibly uh, enticing, um, tempting offer of like you can you can get rich quick in without harming anyone and the problem the truth that is that's just not so unfortunately <laughs> what and, and but when that's touched your soul when you've seen someone close to you make 10 times or 100 times their money with no effort it kind of affects you it it, it does have an, a kind of destabilizing effect i think on our being and on our character you know, I think it does kind of hack human psychology in a way, like when you see your kind of local kind of area of people that you know, and maybe one of them makes it rich and maybe maybe a hundred of them, you know, lose money, but you're always going to remember the one, right? And fundamentally, like, 
you know, maybe the people that are like are not actually kind of accelerationists. Maybe they don't want to kind of like move capitalism into the absolute most extreme form of itself, where there's there's no dignity, there's no regulation, we're all just animals in a pit, right? Scrubbing for money in the dirt, right? You know, maybe that's not what they want, but that seems to be like the outcome that seems to be happening as a result of some of these like completely unregulated markets. Um, and so, you know, obviously that has an appeal to some people. Like you can trade your know, bubbles, you can trade these kind of, you know, crazy, toxic, socially corrosive products. But then the question becomes, you know, should you? And ultimately, is it is it ultimately undermining the markets that you want to trade? Or maybe you just care about the short-term position. Maybe it's all just about getting in, getting the money, getting out. You know, there's no, you know, there's, you know, God is dead, nothing matters, you're a nihilist, right? Perhaps. But like, you know, if everybody did that. As a whole, in society, we're heading toward extinction. Like basically, this is it can't work at scale, right? And uh, even if you're like a, a capitalist and you believe in these things, like you should want markets to kind of work, maybe slightly lower than like the, this extreme. Yeah. So to sum up the critique position, this is a like would be this is a pathological form of capitalism that doesn't result in price formation on collective enterprise goods or services. People are just betting on financial fantasy cast in the sky detached from any day-to-day -day reality of human life and allowing for kind of a corrosion of our trust in markets by allowing the kind of the sharks or completely exploitative asymmetric information setups to, to, to just run unregulated, unsupervised. And what is the purpose then? You know, what, what is that? that? That just seems both kind of damaging whatever position you come from, whether you're anti-capitalist or incredibly pro-capitalist, that doesn't seem healthy in the long run. And I think even for those partaking in it, as you said, unless you're incredibly short term, it's corrosive in the long run. It's going to destroy trust and destroy, you know, like uh, take away the very thing that you're, you're, you're working on. So I want to kind of come back now just to finish off, run out the episode to summarize essentially. So we've, to, to, to come back to that, we have examined one particular, perhaps very important ideology, one that's may, not often maybe made explicit, it's often more implicit, which is, I just want to trade this stuff. I just want to make money if I can. It's, it's something to trade uh, in that way. And at the heart of that is what we'd call a market fundamentalist or even a Wild West market mentality. You know, markets are a steel man version, you know, Evolution may not be attractive, but it works. It leads to fitter, uh, more complex, more powerful organisms making it than others. And the same is true of markets. We want markets to be like natural selection. And if the sharks eat the minnows, that's good for the sharks. The sharks get stronger and the minnows learn, maybe in this case. Maybe they don't die, but they lose their, some of their life savings. They'll learn for next time. Um, and in short, our critique is, one is that there's these huge information asymmetries that creates a real issue and it undermined. And if you allow that to play out, it not only transfers wealth leading to more inequality, but it also leads to a reduction in faith, not only maybe in financial markets, which if you believe in financial markets, important, but in maybe trust and faith in our social institutions in general, which almost everyone could care about. Is there anything you want to add to that in the summation, uh, Stephen? Yeah, I think the best summary I can come up with it is that like the crypto market um, looks terribly pathological. It looks like, um, to use the economics, it's kind of like a captive market uh, for like fictitious commodities, which is actually kind of a term for Marxism, where it's like commodities that you can trade independent of their use value or any kind of uh, labor value um, that are basically exist purely to be traded. Uh, they are circular in their definition. And unfortunately, these are like fictitious commodities that are controlled by sort of an opaque, unregulated market that seems to be kind of manipulated by a sort of an economic cartel uh, that basically has access to non-public information and can make markets however they see fit. So that to me, you know, does not seem like a particularly, you know, it's not the epitome of capitalism. It's kind of the, you know, the opposite of a, a good working market economy. Now that's great if you're inside the cartel, but it's not so great if you aren't. And ultimately, you know, at scale, like to use the, the pond analogy, like, you know, the sharks are going to eat the minnows, but we don't want the whole pond to die because at the end of the day, you know, it's unsustainable. If you eat up all of the fish, then ultimately this becomes a kind of ultimately, you know, self-destructive kind of negative sum game, right? And to me, 
given all of the kind of market dynamics and information asymmetry and non-regulation um, and just the just vast differentials, it seems like the crypto market seems like a wealth transfer from the public, um, basically to a very small set of insiders. That's basically all but guaranteed by the kind of information asymmetry that's baked into both the assets themselves and the market making. Uh, and, you know, there's a reason that kind of guys like Warren Buffett, I guess would probably fair to say is probably a capitalist, you know, don't look at these things and see something that they don't even like. And they are, you know, capitalists of the highest order, right? And I look at them and see exactly the same thing. And like, I wouldn't touch these markets with a 10 foot bulb because I have no idea what's going on, uh, what's behind the scenes. And uh, I consider myself fairly you know, market friendly in some ways. And uh, this just scares me a lot for many reasons, for the ethical reasons, just for the market efficiency reasons. And like at scale, this could get really, really bad if the general public starts investing these things to like the point where this could cause like financial crises and like systemic risk and large shocks that could just be enormously socially coercive and stir populist and against markets. Yeah. Well, so to round out, if you want to keep following uh, our analyses, please check out lifeitself.us slash web3, uh, where we'll be posting new episodes. And also, obviously, Stephen uh, has an incredible uh, blog and Twitter. Uh, you can follow him at SMDL uh, deal. I will put it in the show notes. For me, you can follow me at uh, twitter.com slash for life itself or twitter.com slash Rufus Pollock. And we've really enjoyed, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've really enjoyed having your, your participation uh, as an audience. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.